Amen. Amen. Well, if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Jonah. That's where we're going to be at today. We're going to be in Jonah chapter 2 through just the first couple of verses of uh, chapter 3. It's going to be on pages 726 and 727 of the Pew Bible. If you don't have a Bible, you're more than welcome to grab one of those Bibles. You can take it home with you. It's a gift from us to you. And our only, at, our only request would be that you would use it, that you would uh, bring it with you, that you would read it at your ho- at home, and that you would think through these things. But uh, this morning we're going to be in Jonah chapter 2 in the beginning of verse 3. Twenty years ago, November of 2003, that doesn't seem possible that that was 20 years ago, but it was, um, a friend of mine uh, who was 78 years old at the time, Pastor Curtis McLean Sr., came out of retirement to pastor Broadway Baptist Church in downtown St. Louis. Broadway Baptist Church is not in the most thriving of communities in St. Louis, um, nor would it have been in a community that would have been welcoming of a 70-year-old, a 78-year-old uh, Caucasian male. But in his heart, he felt burdened for this community and the fact that they'd been pastorless. So he took this call upon himself, and he went and he began to share. His love for the community was immediately contagious and felt by everyone. Matter of fact, he... Um, He began to be more akin to the community than he did to the congregants because he was a part of the community. And one of the first things that he did in establishing his ministry there was he started a food pantry in the basement of the church. And in this food pantry, he just had some just, it was more or less peanut butter and jelly and bread and some coffee and some canned goods and things of that nature. And it was his pride and joy that after every service, those of Uh, those in the neighborhood that were transient, that didn't have homes, that he would be able to provide them some coffee and and some food and things of that nature. And he began to go out in the community and get to know them. And he just, he'd really become a part of that community. But something unexpected happened on January 11th of 2004. After the service, he took a homeless man uh, downstairs to make him a peanut butter and jelly sandwich and some coffee. Well, his wife went to take her Sunday afternoon nap in his office, as is holy and right. Uh, When she awoke several hours later, she found her husband in the basement unconscious, covered in blood and coffee grounds. The transient man had beat him over the head with the glass coffee jar and had taken his wallet and keys, and she walked outside to find his car missing. Now, transient man wasn't smart enough to drive a stick shift, so he didn't get very far, but they did find the remainder of his stuff, minus the few bucks he had in his wallet, a little bit further away. The community was in outrage, and there was some less than righteous men within the community that made it their personal agenda to seek justice. At the bequest of his son, Curtis McLean Jr., they did not harm the man, but they did find the man and bring him to authorities where he was arrested and put on trial. This was personal for me because it was a friend. It was a man that had been on my ordination committee, and his son had been my professor. He is the one that taught me Greek, and he's the one that uh, taught me to uh, enjoy life a little bit because he knew how to enjoy life. He's the one that taught me the joy of allowing bagpipes to get your blood boiling because he was Scottish, as any good McLean would be. And um, uh, it was just, it was personal. And so they asked me if I would go and fill the pulpit. And so I did. And that was my first time preaching consecutively at a church, was at Broadway Baptist Church. Nothing like being thrust into the media's eyes as the news arrived to find out what was going on. And the news was prone to take all kinds of things out of context at the time and and try to make it this vengeful thing as try as we might. But Curtis McLean Jr. was interviewed and this is what he had to say. God has gifted us not only to believe but to suffer for his name's sake. So suffering 
is a gift of God. I see this as a blessing and as an honor. My dad served Christ all his life, and he was given the opportunity to go out on the front lines. When asked about the criminal by myself, I can remember Curtis McLean Jr. saying, I just pray that the man would come to know the grace of God. Church, how hard is that to say about the man that killed your father? Church, let me ask you this. How hard would it be to say, I just pray the ones that come to know my son, that killed my son, would come to experience my grace? And yet, this is the beauty of the radical nature of the forgiveness of God that encompasses his grace. This is what Jesus declares, Therefore I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little, loves little. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven. When we look around, I think oftentimes we are not burdened by the nature of repentance and forgiveness and grace because we don't realize just how deep our sin goes. Just as outraged as I would be at this man who killed a friend of mine and his and, and a friend of me being a friend of his son, and and yet to say, I hope he experiences the grace that I have can only come from one that is transformed by understanding that we don't deserve it either. Those who look around and see sin as the greatest tragedy in our lives are truly able to love God and others because they are not looking at the world and God as someone that owes them something, but as those that could be blessed in the same way we are. This is the beauty of of repentance. And through Jonah's example, God is calling you and I to experience it for ourselves. Through Jonah's example, God is calling you and I to experience the the beauty of genuine repentance. And, And we cannot help but see this in the book of Jonah. Because Jonah has been running from declaring the repentance of God. As was said before, these people were horrible people. They were murderers. They were torturers. They were horrible people. And yet, Jonah could not understand why God would send him to declare to them repentance. Because what if they listened What if they experienced repentance? What if they experienced the forgiveness of God? How could God forgive horrible sinners like that? So 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 God took Jesus, or took Jesus, I'm sorry. God took Jonah on this journey of experiencing what it was like to be a sinner in need of God. What it was like to be someone in need of repentance. And that's the story we have worked our way through. As Jonah finds himself in the belly of a fish, pondering what is next for his life. It's in that moment that he experiences genuine, I believe, genuine repentance, though ultimately he will fail to recognize it. So with that in mind, I'm going to read for us. I'm going to start in the middle of verse 6, and I was asked, okay, so pastor, you're really confusing me, right? Because you're like 6b through 3-2. Do you not know how to find an even chapter and verse? I don't like how they divided Jonah, okay? I don't like it. Um, Sometimes these verses, by the way, chapters and verse numbers are not inspired by God. They were not there in the original Greek and Hebrew, and sometimes they put them there. I understand why, so we can find our place but we miss things in the transitions. And, and so uh, we're going we're gonna to do this. And it just so happens that verse 6 begins in the middle of a sentence. And so we're going to start at the beginning of that sentence there and read through. So you can follow along in your Bibles. You can follow along on the screen. But if you would follow along as I read God's word for you this morning. 
I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. Yet you brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. When my life was fainting away, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came to you and to your holy temple. Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. But I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will pay. Salvation belongs to the Lord. And the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah out upon the dry land. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it the message that I tell you. Thus saith the Lord. As we, as we turn here, I want us to begin by looking at repentance from the end of verse 6 through verse 7, and I think it's important for me to kind of define repentance. It's one of those 10-cent words that we use as Christians that if you're not a Christian or haven't grown up in a church, you may not fully comprehend. And so repentance is this idea of turning, right? But it's a turning from something and to something. So repentance then is turning from sin and rebellion and turning to God and His grace, That's how I'm going to use it today anyways, okay? So it's this idea of turning, if I'm walking in this direction, this is the path of sinfulness, this is the path that leads to destruction, this is the way that we all by children, by born in flesh and blood are going, right? I'm running to sin. Repentance is turning away from that sin and turning to God in faith. Believing what he says is true and walking in newness of life, in a new direction, right? And so this is what we see here. And we see this turning, and I'm going to view it in three ways. The first way that we see this turning is a turning from self-reliance to dependence. Self-reliance to dependence. As you begin, if you were to look up a little bit further that we looked at last week in verse 17 and chapter 2, verse 1, once again, they divide it oddly in my opinion, um, we see a change in transition and it says, the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Then we have this word that we tend to skip over in chapter 2, then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish. I bring this up because I meant to bring it up last week, and afterwards, Henry, being wise as he is, came up to me and said, Pastor, what about this? And I meant to bring it up, and I didn't, because once again, the stinking chapter heading gets in the way here of chapter 2, and we kind of skim over things uh, when we're doing that. There's this word there, then Jonah prayed to the Lord. Three days in the belly of the fish... And as John and I were talking, it's probably not what's pictured in the movies and on like the little cartoon things in our Sunday school classes, right? Right? It's probably not what's pictured on VeggieTales. I know I keep picture, uh, picking on VeggieTales, but you know, in VeggieTales, there's like this whale. He's swallowed up by this whale. And inside the whale, there's like ships that are wrecked right? And there's this great cavernous space, and he's like talking to his little worm friend, right? And because worms can talk and vegetables. But, um, you know, he's talking, and, and we have this idea that it's like, yeah, it's, it's uncomfortable, but he's breathing air like normal, and he's, he's talking, you know, to, to himself, if you will, and he's got plun, ton, tons of space. Odds are he was swallowed by a fish, and he's like, smushed, right? Like there's not room for him to move. And it says at the beginning that he's got seaweed wrapped around his neck and his head, right? And he's probably covered in mucus from the, you know, like the fish is trying to digest him, right? Like I I know this is grotesque for a moment, but I need you to understand just how awful this moment was. And he is like this. There's, this, There's no lights on, by the way. Like, I don't know any fish that has a light in its belly, right? So he's in the dark, he's covered in goo, he's, the fish is trying to digest him, he doesn't know where he's at, he doesn't know what's going on, he's squished up for three days and three nights, then he prays. Now, I don't know about you, but I, that is one of two things. Either Jonah is foolish, he's a little slow maybe, or he's just stubborn. 
I, I think, I think it's probably two. It's the second one. He's, he's stubborn. And that's the truth with all of us, right? We, we, we have to butt our heads against the concrete wall over and over and over again until we get it through our thick skulls that we can't do this on our own. Who knows what Jonah was doing in there? Maybe he was trying to tickle the fish. Maybe he was trying to punch the fish. Who knows what he was trying to do to get this fish to let him go, right? But even if it did, where was he at? At the bottom of the ocean, right? Like Jonah had no hope three days, three nights, then he prays to God. Jonah, still in the belly of the fish, is unwilling to give up the reins of his life and give them to the Lord. He still thinks he has this thing in the bag. Or at least he's willing to die trying. Church, may we not be this kind of person. And it says, verse 6, verse 7, sorry, the beginning of verse 7, when my life was fainting away. In the belly of this fish, stubborn-hearted, everything else, and my, my life was fainting away. This is an idiom, by the way, in Hebrew, and so it's really hard to translate into Greek, okay? Because Idioms are are words, they're phrases that we put together that make no sense when we look at the individual the individual words, right? Fine as a frog hair split three ways. I don't care if you're from the Ozarks or not, you know what it means, but it doesn't mean that, right? Because frogs don't have hair. And you can't split that three ways, right? Like that's it's it just doesn't work, right? These are the kinds of things that we say, and so this idiom, we have to try to translate, we have to try to understand it, and it's literally this idea, and it's only used here in Jonah, it's this idea of his spirit turning in on itself. Like he's being giving up on himself, like his, his, his spirit is giving out, he's just going to give up. That's the best way I can understand this. And so that's why they're saying it this way, when my life is, is fainting away, my, when my life is just giving up. He gets to this point where he just, he has to finally br- be broken and just, I guess this is it. I guess I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna quit. Then it says, I remembered the Lord. Then, in the pit, fighting for his life, and he gives up, and then he just remembers the Lord. He remembers Yahweh, the covenant-keeping God. Now, we've been looking at this, or we looked at this this last week. Um, Mark Haynes helped us to look at the book of Judges and this idea that these, these people would grow up not knowing God, and then the Lord would bring them a judge that would bring them, you know, they'd bring calamity upon them. They would cry out to God. The Lord would bring them a judge to save them and teach them about God. And then another generation grows up, and there's 12 cycles of that in the book of Judges. And we look down our noses at them, and then we look at passages like Jonah, and we say, how did Jonah forget the Lord? Right? Like, how did you forget God? First you're trying to run from him, now you've forgotten him. Which is it, Jonah? What are you, what are you doing? Right? This is, this is the, the point that we have here, is that then in this moment, he remembers the Lord. This is something that Moses was adamant about. Matter of fact, if you study the book of Deuteronomy, just underline all the times that it mentions remembering or forgetting. Because it's one of the most prominent themes throughout the book of Deuteronomy. And as you, as you read through that, you can begin to understand that, you know what? We people, sinful people, are prone to what Paul Tripp calls identity amnesia. We're prone to forget who we are and who God is. Right? And, and Jonah is in the same boat. He, he suddenly remembers. It's in this moment of brokenness that he finally turns and he remembers. And then it says, And my prayer came to you into your holy temple. That's when he prays. 
How often do we wait until we're in our moments of despair to depend upon the Lord? But what if we lived a life of dependence upon the Lord all the time? What if we put God's word before us all the time, whether that be coming to church, being a part of a Sunday school class, reading our Bibles, whether that be listening to, to gospel-saturated music, what, whatever that means, but we, we keep it before ourselves all the time so that we remember, apart from God's great plans and purposes, we can do nothing. This was the danger in the book of James. This is why he says, some of you say you're going to go do this, and you're going to go do this, and he says, But what you should say is, if the Lord wills, I will go and do these things. Because we have no control over tomorrow. We have no control over today. In my mind right now, I'm thinking, in a few short minutes, I will walk next door and I will eat delicious food. Right? I I can smell the turkey and the ham. I can smell the sweet potato casserole because that's the best Thanksgiving dish there is on planet Earth right? Like, I can, I I can, and and I have in my mind these all things, but we're not promised that. That was our plans and our intentions. You're like, wait a minute, pastor, did you dupe me into coming to church today for a meal we can't have? No, there's a meal. I'm just saying that we don't know that the Lord's not going to come back. We don't know these things. We have to leave, live every moment as a, as a intentionality that we're going to live for the Lord. Sin is denying God's ownership of you and seeking to live life apart from him. Seeking to live by my own bootstraps. When in fact God created us to be wholly dependent upon them. And this is most readily experienced through a vibrant prayer life. You want to know how we begin to forget God? Stop praying. If you read the statistics over prayer in America, you can understand why we are in the situation we are in. I'm not talking about non-Christians. I'm talking about church people. When they're questioned about their prayer life, it is one of the most discouraging things to read and I know as a church we harp on prayer all the time but but prayer is a reminder prayer does not change the heart of God prayer aligns me with what God has already promised prayer changes my heart it helps me be in dependence upon God prayer puts me in that place where I humbly say I cannot do this apart from your will prayer puts me in that place to say I can't handle this family member apart from you doing something in me prayer puts me in that place to say I can't do this job unless you give me the strength and the wisdom prayer puts us in that place to say I can't share the gospel with my children unless you help me Prayer is that thing that puts us in regular, humble dependence upon the Lord because you don't cry out to God unless you think you actually need his help. So my question for you is as we evaluate this gift, this beautiful opportunity to repent, we have to evaluate what areas in our life we are not living dependently upon the Lord. What are the areas in our life that we're prone to not pray about? What are the areas in our life that we're prone to not bring before the Lord? Because these are the areas where we need to be practicing repentance today. Maybe it's the little things of life. Maybe it's the big things that you think you've got together. Whatever it is, what are the things that you find yourself living in self-dependence in? Jonah had to come to a broken, contrite spirit that recognized apart from God, he couldn't do anything. Secondly, we see in verses 8 through 9, a turning from idolatry to thanksgiving turning from idolatry to thanksgiving he says those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love but i with the voice of thanksgiving will sacrifice to you what i vowed i will pay salvation belongs to the lord jonah helps us understand 
that the place of non-repentance is not a lack of worship. Hear me out. Not worshiping God doesn't mean that I'm not worshiping anything. It means that I'm worshiping something other than God. And anything I worship other than God is called idolatry. Now, we think when we talk about idols, we think about, you know, these, what we might see in India up on the shelf with all these little figurines and everything else, and they light candles and, and do different things, and they, they have to feed them every day, and they have different little rituals that they do, and that's how we, we think about idols, right? But in reality, idol can be anything. An idol can be food. An idol can be our vehicles, our homes. An idol could be our children. We can make anything an idol. Just, it's Christmas time. So read your papers with this in mind. Anything I think can change my life more than God can is an idol. I remember years ago, there was a TV commercial that came out. And it was this idea of change your TV, change your life. And I thought, really, that's all it takes? For a few hundred bucks, I could change my life by having a better TV. I can be more attached to that thing on my wall, right? I can, I can go and sacrifice my time at the altar of the great LED TV, right? Like, this is... I jokingly say that, but those are the kinds of things that capture our heart. One author says this, that the heart is a perpetual idol factory. We just produce one thing after another that we're going to worship. We get rid of this thing, and then we produce another thing. We get rid of this thing, and we produce another thing. Jonah is saying that if I'm going to repent, then I have to turn from my vain idols. I have to turn away from those things. I love the prophets and how they talk about idols. Because, children in the room, if you want to, like, make a funny comic, just read the prophets and how they talk about idols. Isaiah does it, Jeremiah does it, Daniel does it. They all do it, right? Let me just read to you a portion of of Jeremiah so that maybe we would just realize how foolish our idols are here. Jeremiah chapter 10, verses 2 through 6. Thus says the Lord, learn not the way of the nations, nor be dismayed at the signs of the heavens, because the nations are dismayed by them. For the customs of the people are vanity. A tree from the forest is cut down and worked with an axe by the hands of a craftsman. They decorate it with silver and gold. They fasten it with a hammer and nails so that it cannot move. Their idols are like scarecrows in a cucumber field. Now, if that is not an analogy for you, right? I know it's not summer, if you will, but their idols are like scarecrows and a cucumber field, and they cannot speak. They have to be carried, for they cannot walk. Do not be afraid of them, for they cannot do evil. Evil neither is it in them to do good. There is none like you, O Lord. You are great, and your name is great in might. Jeremiah says, these idols that we worship, these false things that we worship in our life, are like a scarecrow and a cucumber field. Right? Like, you got all your cucumbers laid out there, right? And all the vines are all over the ground. Right? And nothing's more frustrating than weeding and weeding and and weeding um, and weeding a cucumber patch, right? And then you're trying to keep them upright. You're trying to do all these things and watering them and taking care of them. And you're afraid the birds are going to come eat them. And so they put up these scarecrows. Um, I always get a kick out of going to Lyle and Maryland's around corn time as it starts to get close to that time he brings out his little scarecrows and puts them in the in the corn patch so that he can share his goods with everyone right and 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 inevitably he'll go out there and he'll see that some raccoon or groundhog or or bird has wised up to realize that this thing is fake that's what jeremiah says our idols are like I have to carry them and put them in place. They can't talk for me. They can't do anything. They can't scream at the birds and say, hey, get out of here. They can't do anything for me. And they're like, well, pastor, I just don't know. I just don't know if, if I have anything like that. I just don't know if I, 
You know, I don't go out in the woods and cut down a tree and carve it up. No. You go to work 40 hours a week. Turn these little pieces of paper that are now digital signs on your phone. And then you go and spend those digital signs that they really have no value apart from what they mean, right? They're not gold or silver or some other precious metal. They're, they're just a piece of paper printed by the U.S. government for us. And we go and we, we spend those on something that we think is going to give us life, like ice cream. And it just gives us indigestion, Right? And, and, and we think that it's going to somehow bring us something. Maybe it's not that, but maybe it's a, a car. And so then we'll give ourselves to this, this car. And Lord knows it costs a fortune to buy one. You've got to mortgage your liver to get one. And, and so you go and you, you promise your life away to work even more hours so that you can afford this thing, so that you can do these things, and you can't afford it. And so then you give more of your life away so that you can do this next thing. And next thing you know, you're like, I just don't know when I have time for Jesus. No, we don't worship idols. We are captured by them. We're enslaved by them. And Jonah says, those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. They forsake their hope of grace. Because instead of understanding that nothing we have is ours, instead of understanding that we cannot earn enough things, they forsake all of that rest that is in Christ Jesus and knowing that he has given us every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places and they begin to work for vain things that leave them feeling empty. They long for something else to fill their hearts or their lives. They long to have greater and greater, and instead of being content in the Lord, they find themselves discontent and always looking for more, bigger, better, shinier, newer. And yet, as Jonah says, idolatrous worship always leaves you feeling empty and complaining about needing more. Look to the areas of your life where you allow yourself to fret and worry and complain and you will find the idols in your own life. What they cannot fulfill, God can. So Jonah is telling them, you know, they're, these, these people pay, vain, pay regard to vain idols and they forsake their hope and steadfastness. I think he may have in his mind those, those pagan mariners he just got off the ship with. Right? They were crying out to all their idols, and they found them empty. They couldn't save them. And then he says, but I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you. This is what false worship is. I'm going to turn from that, and I'm going to turn to genuine worship. And that means that I'm going to sacrifice with a voice of thanksgiving. One of the best ways to turn from idolatry is to turn to gratitude. Because idolatry always tells you you don't have enough. But God always tells you you have everything you need. God tells you, I am sufficient. God tells you, rest. I've accomplished these things. God tells you, I have the whole world under control. But these idols tell you you need to do more. It's going to fall apart. You can't do this. It's not going to work. You, you, need to do, you need to make more money. You need to do more things. It's never going to be enough. He says, but I, with a voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you. It's not that God would repay him but he sacrifices because God has already done more than he could ever imagine. Turning from idolatry to thanksgiving leads us to obedience. It 
it leads us to obedience. There's a difference when I tell my children, go clean your room, and then you can have some brownies. Mom's brownies are always coveted in our house, right? And so, go clean your room, and then you can have some brownies. There's a difference in that and saying, if you clean your room, you can have brownies. Do you, do you catch the difference? I think in the Christian life, we think to ourselves, if I pray, if I read, if I go, if I give, if, if, that then we can experience the joy of Christ. Then we can experience freedom. And we make everything in the Christian life a conditional clause. Instead of understanding, like Jonah, the brownies or the joy are waiting for you. Go do these things because they're waiting for you. You've already, it doesn't matter how, how good you did or what you did. You've, the brownies are here. They're waiting for you. The joy is ready for you. Church, the glory of heaven is awaiting It is kept in heaven for you. It is guarded by faith in God, and he has even provided that. Nothing can take it away. No rust or moth can destroy. No thief can break in and steal. It is secured for us. So all of our obedience is not out of some sort of earning of salvation, but is out of a gratitude of what Christ has already done for us. And then I love how Jonah He ends this prayer. He doesn't say amen. Do we understand what amen means when we we pray? Amen simply means I agree. I think sometimes we say it like it's a code, right? It's a Christian code, like, okay, you can open your eyes and lift your head now, right? And, And then if you have to say in the name of Jesus Christ, because if you don't say that, then you don't mean in the name of Jesus Christ, right? I'm joking by the way. No, we say that because we're reminding ourselves that I pray this not on my own authority or my own value, but on what Christ has already accomplished for me. I come to you under his authority, and I'm praying these things, and amen means, and we all agree, right? Like, so when somebody in church says amen, that's what they mean is, I agree with you, preacher. In other words, that's a hint. It's okay to say amen at times. Thank you. See, we got it down now. But that's not how Jonah ends his prayer. How does he end his prayer? Salvation belongs to the Lord. Where is Jonah? In the belly of a fish. Salvation belongs to the Lord. I haven't received it yet, but I know the truth. There is no salvation apart from what he does. Salvation is in God's hand. Whatever he wills, he will do. I'm going to trust him in these things. Salvation belongs to the Lord. uh, This prayer, this turning from idolatry to thanksgiving, allows me to be obedient, and it creates in me a heart that wants to proclaim the truth of what God has already done. We cannot keep silent like Uh, Jeremiah says, it's like a fire in my bones. It's burning if I don't tell other people about what God has done. Idolatry is trying to appease an imaginary God to get something we think we need. Worship is responding with thanksgiving to the God who already has given us everything in Christ Jesus. In other words, idolatry is focusing on me myself and I, and worship is focused on him and him alone. What that means, church, is it's a very real possibility that you could walk through these doors, you could sit in these chairs, and you could be worshiping an idol. Because the the God of Scripture comes and he declares his truth. He declares that he has accomplished all these things and that he is worthy of praise, and yet we could walk through these doors expecting for ourselves to be worshipped. I do this so that he will give, so that I will have, so that I will feel.
Do your thoughts and words reflect self-focus or thanksgiving and Godward praise? Finally, I want us to see there's a turning from fish food to fishermen. He stops praying, and it says, and the Lord, Yahweh, it's the word used there, is the covenant-keeping God's name, spoke to the fish. We have this idea of the same kind of thing that we see in Genesis, right? The power of God's word creating. Now he's speaking to the fish, and the fish obeys, and it vomited Jonah out upon the dry land. I want to look at this in a couple of ways. Number one, I need us to see that this faithful, covenant-keeping God remained faithful to Jonah. He didn't have to just because Jonah prayed. He did so because that was his character. Just because Jonah prayed didn't mean that God had to provide salvation for him. But he did because he loved him and he cared for him. But when God provides salvation, it's not always clean. The word picture used here is violent. I don't want to get too grotesque here, but you just got to read it. He vomited him out on dry land, right? This is like stomach flu violence, right? Like this is not a pretty picture. When you watch movies, I remember being a young man, you know, no children, and you watch movies and you see these children being born, and, and they hand them to the father, and they're, they're like clean with a pacifier in their mouth, and they, you know, they're smiling and all those things. And then you have an actual child, and they hand them to you, and they're like, By the way, keep aspirating this nasty-looking thing, or he'll die. Okay. You know, I'm like, I don't know. I don't know what I'm doing with this thing. You know, right? It's covered in goo and grossness and, you know, like, I I think we have this picture in our minds that salvation is like the first picture of having a child, right? That when we're saved, suddenly there's like angels like singing around us and there's a halo on us and we are, we are suddenly no longer struggle with those things and those problems anymore. But Jonah, he, he is vomited out, he's saved, he's vomited back on the ground and the stench of the inside of that fish is still on him. Right, like there's a reminder to this. There, there's a Sometimes we think salvation is is easy and clean, but he does this, and I want us to see this other thing. Jonah is saved, and the Lord has this fish vomit him up on dry land. It's not like Jonah, he's like, okay, I'll save Jonah, and he throws him up in the middle of the ocean and says, now swim. No, he puts him in a place where he's able to to walk and do the will of the Lord. Now, he may stink while he's doing it, but he he puts him in this place where he's able to do these things. Jonah's experience of salvation was messy, but in the messiness of this salvation, it says these beautiful words. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time. The beauty of repentance. The Lord did not have to give him a second chance. And yet he graciously did so. How many times has the word of the Lord spoken us the truth of the gospel and yet we ignore it? And it's not a second time, a third time, a fourth time, a fifth time, a 100th time. And yet the Lord keeps reminding and keeps telling us and keeps inviting us into his Space And he tells Jonah these beautiful words, Arise, go to Nineveh. Jonah's salvation and our salvation 
hear me out, Jonah's salvation and our salvation includes an invitation to go and tell. It includes an invitation to go and tell. The Lord not only graciously saved a sinner like Jonah that had every good, measurable thing in hand and yet rebelled against God and did his own thing, he not only gave him a second chance at life, but he also called him to be a missionary. Go and tell other people. That isn't because Jonah was so awesome. That's because God was awesome. Because God could rescue. Because God could redeem. God's salvation was never intended to be independent of his invitation to the world. God uses broken sinners like you and I to reach other broken sinners. So here's my question for you. Do you find yourself uncomfortable when you are not telling other people about Jesus? I hope you understood how I asked that. It was different than how we typically ask that, right? We typically say, are you telling other people about Jesus? And you're like, no, I'm I'm, I'm uncomfortable talking to lost people about Jesus. Look, God has not called all of us to go out here to the stoplight and scream at people and tell them to repent and believe. He hasn't done that. But he has called all of us, and wherever he has put us, in all of our going to tell other people about Jesus. Sometimes that's to parents at school that are hurting and struggling. Sometimes that's to a neighbor that we see sick and we go and reach out to them. Sometimes that's to a fellow kid. It could be all kinds of things, but he calls us, nevertheless, to go and tell other people, not because we're perfect, not because we have all the right words, not because we have it all together, but he calls us to be uncomfortable when we are not telling other people about him. This is a sign of genuine repentance. So church, are you turning today? Or are you stuck in your own tragedy? The tragedy today would be to know the Creator, know His calling on your life, and to harden your heart to these truths. You see, it took a storm of epic proportions, being thrown overboard into the crashing waves three days and three nights in the belly of a fish before Jonah would finally come to his senses. But I pray today you would allow the majestic glory of God's grace to break your heart, draw you close, and burden you to tell others about the good news. Do this in three ways. Put down your arms of rebellion and get on your knees. Stop the busy work and personal agenda and the bitterness and dwell on the majesty and beauty of Christ our Savior. Quit running towards destruction by self-sabotage and run to proclaim the victory that has already been won in Christ Jesus. It's not complicated, but it is hard. It requires us to turn from ourself and turn to the Lord. Let's pray towards that end today. Dearly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it gives us hope. And it reminds us about second chances. Lord God, I pray that today you would help us to do that, that you would help us to to turn from whatever sin in our life. Maybe it's an area of self-dependence in which we're trying to do life without you. Maybe it's an area in our life in which we are worshiping something other than you because we need something to fulfill us. We're looking at vain things for that. Maybe today it's just that we've kept too silent 
about the gifts you've given us in Christ Jesus. Whatever it is, Lord God, I pray that you would work those things in our heart. That you would help us to repent and believe. Because salvation belongs to the Lord. Amen. This morning, this is your opportunity to respond to the Word of God. Maybe you need a moment in which you continue praying. That's fine. Pray. Maybe you need a moment in which uh, you need to confess to the Lord your uh, idols and seek His help. That's fine. But for everybody else, I just ask that you would stand and proclaim His excellencies to one another in song. So if you would, please respond to the Lord.